the name of the Father, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, tomorrow, God willing, we will start the Jonas fast, and that's why I like to speak about Jonah as a servant. Jonah as a servant. Uh, I know I should not focus on his weaknesses since Jonah is a great prophet. But just for the sake of our benefit, I ask Prophet Jonah and to forgive me uh, that I will speak about his weaknesses, not as actually as a source of judgment, but more as a way for us to learn and to benefit from this. But definitely, Jonah is a great, great uh, sir, a prophet. So, the first weakness I like to address in uh, Jonah's life, I will call it uh, serving the easy service. Serving the easy service. In chapter 1, verse 3, we read, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Why Jonah chose Tarshish, Tarshish in particular? If you turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 10, and verse 22. For the king had merchant ships at sea with the fleet of Hiram. Once every three years, the merchant ships came bringing gold, silver, ivory, apes, and monkeys. Uh, these ships were in Tarshish. I don't know why in English it's not mentioned the word Tarshish, but if you read the Arabic, you all, لَأَنَّهُ كَانَ لِلْمَلِكِ فِي الْبَحْرِ سُفُنْ تَرْشِيش مَعَ سُفُنْ حِرَامِ فَكَانَتْ سُفُنْ تَرْشِيش تأتي مرة في كل ثلاث سنوات أتت سفن ترشيش حاملة ذهبا وفضة وعاجا وقرودا وطواويس First King chapter 10-22 فلما يقول إن السفن اللي جاي من ترشيش when it says هي موجودة في العربي ترشيش في الإنجليزي ترجم منها مرشنت التجار فلما يقول السفن اللي جاي من ترشيش كارد جولد سيلفر أيفوري إيبس and monkeys هي بالعربي طواويس الطاووس بالإنجليزي حطوها monkeys فدي معناها إيه معناها إن ترشيش ديا was a very rich city so, many servants, they like actually to choose a comfortable service. And they don't choose uh, the difficult service. For example, if there is a, a person in Egypt and he was given choice either 
to consecrate himself to the service in America, in America or Europe or in Africa. If he chooses America or Europe and not Africa, then he is choosing a comfortable service. Like Jonah, he wants to go to Tarshish. Uh, but a person who consecrates himself to the Lord should accept service in any place, either dealing with difficult people or dealing with easygoing people. And those actually who rebel against God like Jonah, they will lose the blessing of serving with God and seeing how the hand of God can change the hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Nineveh for Jonah was a wicked city, a city full of sin and wickedness and iniquities. That's why he didn't want to go there. And in his mind, Nineveh deserved to be burned, to be destroyed completely. That's why he was not happy with God when God forgave Nineveh. What he did not know is that Nineveh will repent just by five words. He told them after 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. These five words made the whole city from the king to the least in, in a state of repentance. So, but Jonah preferred to go to Tarshish. And if God did not intervene and Jonah went to Tarshish, maybe we would never heard about Jonah. Jonah actually, Tarshish is a rich city and this city was full of pride and arrogance. And if Jonah went there, he would not actually convert. Maybe it will be a challenge to convert or lead anybody to repentance. Sometimes we choose or we, we realize that rich people, if we serve them, then they can cover all the financial uh, needs of the church. Uh, but from experience and from the studying the church history, people who trust God more than money, servants who put their trust in God more than money, actually God will provide for all their needs. And if we analyze what Tarshish had, silver and, and, uh, and gold, actually symbol of richness and greediness. Apes and monkeys symbolizes the desires of the flesh. Because apes and monkeys, they are led by the desires of the flesh they don't have man, mind or intellect. دي مش موجودة بالإنجليزي اللي هي التواويس. التواويس معروف بجماله فرمز إلى الكبرياء. الزهوة الكبرياء. هي موجودة بالعربي مش موجودة بالكنيسة. Can you imagine if San Mark decided not to come to Egypt? Egypt was a difficult city because it was pagan. They were worshiping idols and uh, they have the Greek philosophy. So it was not an easy city. But Mark accepted to come to Egypt and converted the Egyptian to Christianity. Again, what about St. Paul and Greece? He wrote in 2 Corinthians, 
I was in fear and trembling. He said about Ephesians that he fought with beasts in Ephesus. So these apostles, they submit their life to the will of God. And when God actually uh, called them, they went. We need to listen to the word of God as we read in Matthew 21, 28. My son, go today work in my vineyard. Whatever this vineyard, wherever this vineyard, we need actually to accept the calling. You know, in, uh, in Egypt, for example, first grade, second grade, it's not only one class. I remember first grade when I started service, it was maybe 10 or 12 classes. All of them first grade. So they classify them based on uh, their addresses, the regions. And they were very, very good re uh, areas, rich and classy, and very, very poor area. So I remember when the Sun School coordinator uh, had all the, um, the lists of the classes, he asked us a question. Does any one of you want to serve in a certain area? And I just, we're just in you. So all of us were silent. And at the end, he told us, actually, it is the right thing not to choose for, your, for yourself. Uh, God actually appointed to you the area that you will serve and take it from the hand of God. And actually, even he did not appoint to us a certain area. But he, and he took the list and distributed it to us. كل واحد خد لست بتاعته من إيد ربنا. And uh, يعني, I remember this class that I served. It, it was not in, in a rich area. It was in a poor area. But this class was يعني, one of the very, very يعني, close to my heart until now. And I remember even يعني, my students this class until now. Uh, St. Paul, when God called him to go to difficult areas, he did not say no. Let me read some verses like in Acts chapter 20. Acts 20, verse uh, 22. St. Paul said, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But did St. Paul change his mind? He said, no, I'm not going go to go to Jerusalem because chains and tribulations await me. See his response. Verse 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to me, to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Uh, and another time, Agapus took the girdle of St. Paul and said, the Holy Spirit says, the person uh, who had or owned this girdle, actually he will be bound in Jerusalem. So his friend said to Paul, don't, please don't go there. And they start to cry. And he told them, you cry and you make me sorrowful. Because I am willing not only to be bound for the Lord Jesus Christ, but to be killed. So this is the first weakness in the life of Jonah. Second weakness 
laziness and sleep is sleepness. When actually the storm happened, the sailors who were not actually godly, they did not believe in God, they were pagan, they were praying. The only one who actually knows the true God was doing what was sleeping. As you read in, in, in Jonah chapter 1, verse 6, so the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. What do you mean, sleeper? Mean why you are sleeping? Why you are sleeping? Sleeping here means you sleep in time of urgency. You should be working, but rather you are sleeping. Sleeping symbolizes the non-responsiveness to the circumstances around you. So there are circumstances around you that actually calls on you to respond immediately. You hear that one of your children start doing drugs, but you are numb. You don't respond to this. You hear that one of your children is leaving the church and joining another denomination. And you, you can say, what should I do? What can I do? It's easy choice. Like Jonah, there was a storm and people were perishing, but he was sleeping. A Sunday school servant should be alert should be alert to the circumstances going around him. And he should respond and react when there is emergence or a situation that demands you should react. Sometimes we sleep because we don't want to take responsibility or want to isolate ourselves or because we are numb to others and to their needs. Jonah, when there was a storm, we read in verse 5, Jonah 1, 5, then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. You can see everyone is doing something, throwing the cargo, crying to their gods. They're trying to find a solution. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest part of the ship, had lain down and was fast asleep. As if there is nothing around him. Uh, Jonah considered this situation is not his. Although he knew very well that this is storm because of him. But this carefree attitude, as if what's happening is not related to him. Do you have zeal? When you go to Sunday school and you find one person in your class missing, do you notice what happens to your heart? Do you feel anxious? You want to go and ask about this person, why he is missing? Or you don't care? Like Cain when said, am I a guardian to my brother? Uh, in one of the books of Christian leadership about the pastors, he said, the author, if a pastor enters the church and found somebody is missing, someone is missing, and he did not notice, or he noticed, but his heart was not moved with zeal, then he is not qualified to be a pastor. It's a Protestant book. Where is your zeal? Where is your zeal? Uh, 
in in Proverbs chapter six verse nine. We read, how long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? Also, in Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 5, uh, he who sleeps in harvest is a son who causes shame. So, this time is harvest. Harvest to the glory of God to the field of the Lord. In John chapter 4, the Lord said to the disciples, lift up your eyes and see now the fields are white. It's time for harvest. So if there is a time for harvest to go and preach the gospel, but who are sleeping during this time of harvest, then we are causing uh, shame. Uh, if you see how many people lost because of sleep which means laziness many many people for example Sisera was killed while he was asleep you can read this in Judges chapter 4 verse 21 and 22 Then Jill, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him, to Sisera, and drove the peg into his temple, and it went down to the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. So Sisera, although he was in a state of war, if he was alert, he would not kill. He would, would, would not be killed. Many times, Satan kills us spiritually in the same way. When we are not alert, when we are not zealous, comes Satan and actually put a trap for us. And then we fall into this trap and we are killed spiritually. Samson. Delilah actually made him sleep on her knees and she called a man to shave his head and then she started to actually despise him and his power uh, left him. In the same way, when we are asleep, carefree, careless, lazy, Satan will do to us like Delilah did to Samson. And we will lose our spiritual power. And we will be despised by others. The disciples of the Lord took them with him to Gethsemane. And he asked them to stay awake for, with him. And to support him. But they couldn't. They were heavy in sleep. Uh, and there are many other symbols, uh, stories in the Bible. And all this story, although the stories speak about physical sleep, but there is a spiritual meaning. A person who is spiritually asleep actually can lose his salvation. That's why we need to be alert spiritually. God always, when we are not alert, he tried to wake up, to wake us up from the slumber of laziness. He, he woke up Jonah through the whale. And uh, Jonah, after he was swallowed by the whale, he realized that his sleep was wrong. He should care for the salvation of Nineveh. Uh, that's why in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 14, 
St. Paul gives us a very important advice. He tells us, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. So he is saying, if you are spiritually asleep, you are dead. Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead. A person who is spiritually asleep, he is like a dead man. Awake and arise, and Christ will give you light. Another verse, actually, in, in Romans chapter 13, and this verse, actually, was the reason to convert St. Augustine. St. Augustine, when he read these verses, actually left his uh, former life in sin and repented. Romans 13, starting from verse 11. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. As Abuna said in the English sermon today, you know, if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. The same meaning here. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Uh, number three, the third weakness. So, number one, Jonah chose easy and rich area, Tarshish. Number two, he was not responsive to a situation that required zeal and response, immediate response. Number three, in in Jonah chapter 1 and verse 9, when the captain uh, asked Jonah, tell us, whose cause is this trouble upon us? What's your occupation? And where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? The first thing Jonah uh, said, I am a Hebrew. I am a Hebrew. And I fear the Lord. I am a Hebrew means that Jonah, all the Israelites, because they were the chosen people of God, they felt they are above the rest of the people. So when he said, I am a Hebrew, means I am not like you, pagan, worshipping idols. And because of this, he refused to go to Nineveh, this evil city full of wickedness. I am a Hebrew. Although being a Hebrew and being a servant of God should be the motive to love these people and to have a desire to serve them. But feeling that he is above the pagan, he is not like the pagan, uh, that's why he refused to go to Nineveh to preach to them. In his mind, Nineveh should be burned. Nineveh should be destroyed. Even he did not sit with the sailor, but he separated himself from them he went to the lowest part of the ship and he slept, separated himself 
from the sailors. You are a prophet. Take this opportunity to speak to them about God. Preach them, evangelize. But no, he did not. He preferred not to talk with these ungodly people. Many servants believe they are in, in a higher uh, status than the rest of the people. Uh, and it can actually appear in some of their words. I'm a Sunday school servant, for example. How dare you talk to me like this? Don't you know me? I'm a Sunday school servant. Or I am coordinator. Or I am in the church board. Or I am a subdeacon. They say it with arrogance, with pride. And instead of saying it with humbleness, because you are a servant. Servant means your calling is to wash the feet of others. And if, if God gives you authority, this authority to serve others, not to rule over others. And that's how God differentiated between his children and uh, the children of the world. He said, do you know that the greatest people in the world, they rule it over them? They rule it over them. But for you, you should not be like this. If you want to be the first, be the last. If you want to be the greatest, be the servant of all. But Jonah said, I am a Hebrew. I'm Hebrew. If we are servants of God, then we have to have a big heart to contain all, to love all, and to serve all. If your heart actually is not open, how, to, especially to people who are away from the church, how can you serve the lost sheep? How can you serve the non-Christian and to evangelize and to preach to them? Sometimes even we are not closed to other believers just because they, are, they go to other, other church different from my church. Like one time the disciples went to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, we found someone casting demon in your name, but we forbid him. Why? Because he doesn't follow us. He's not one of the twelve. That's why you forbid him. The Lord told them, don't forbid him. As long as he is not against me, he is with me. We need to have a big heart. And if God called us in any service, whether Sunday school, whether deaconship, whether church board, anything, don't feel arrogant and rule it over others because of this. Actually, the more responsibility you have, the more humble you should be. And your heart should be open to all. So the first one, Jonah chose the easy and the rich city. Uh, number two, Jonah uh, was a spiritually asleep. Number three, Jonah felt better than the rest of the people. Number four, the weakness in Jonah, he wanted to separate justice from mercy. And he wanted to pursue justice only. Although the book of Psalms says uh, justice and mercy have kissed each other. And this point is very important in dealing with our children. You need to combine both justice and mercy in the same time. 
if you're going to focus only on justice, you will lose many, many people. If you're going to focus only on mercy, you will be so permissive and also you will lose many people. But to keep the balance between justice and mercy is very important. Even in parenting, we say parents should keep the balance between justice and mercy, or we call it love and control. control. Justice is the control, uh, mercy is love. Jonah was angry with God because God forgave Nineveh. In his mind, Nineveh should be destroyed, justice. But God actually responded to him in Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. I'm sure all of you know the story of the plant that lived for one day. So God said to Jonah, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much life is stopped? So here you can compare between Jonah and God. Jonah, when we preached Nineveh, he preached them just the destruction. After 40 days, this city will be destroyed. He did not actually give them any hope of forgiveness. He did not tell them, but if you return to the Lord, God is merciful. God will forgive you, although he knew very well this is the attribute of God. In Jonah chapter 4, verse, um, sorry, in chapter 3, sorry, chapter 4, verse 2, he said, I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Did you share this knowledge with the people in Nineveh? No, he did not. Because he was focusing on justice only. He wanted God to destroy the city after 40 days. Uh, St. Paul explained to us we cannot separate the justice of God from his mercy. In Romans chapter 11, in verse 22, consider the goodness and severity of God. Goodness and severity at the same time. On those who feel severity and toward you goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also be cut off. Consider both. You know this that these people have no knowledge. The Lord said to Jonah, these people cannot discern the right hand from their left, cannot discern. So they were ignorant. No knowledge. Why you did not share with them your knowledge about God? You said, I know that you are a gracious God, slow to anger, abundant in mercy. Why you did not share this with them? Why you did not share what Ezekiel mentioned to us in chapter 22 about God? In Ezekiel 22 and verse 11, no, I think the, the reference, I wrote it wrong. It 
33.11 سوري 33.11 Why you did not share with them what Ezekiel told us about God? As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? But Jonah actually hid all of this. Sometimes we as servants, when we speak with our children, we convey the message that God will discipline you, God will punish you, God will, you know, and we remind them with the hell and the fire that will not be quenched and the, the worms that will not die. And we focus on the justice of God and the punishment in the last day. But see the balance in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke about repentance. He spoke about the Beatitudes. In the same time, he gave us the wo woes and warning. So we need to keep the balance between the justice and the mercy of God. The Pharisees, they preached only the justice of God. When the Lord healed the man who was blind, they said to this man about Jesus, he is not from God because he doesn't keep the Sabbath. Their heart was full of uh, hardness. And when the Lord actually healed the woman that actually was bent, they actually accused the Lord Jesus Christ that he doesn't keep the, sab the th Sabbath. And the Lord told them, if any one of you, your donkey fell in a well or a pit, Aren't you going to actually uh, rescue him? He said, yes. So he said, and this is the daughter of Abraham. Shouldn't I actually heal her even if it is a, the Sabbath? But they did not focus on the mercies of God. Uh, A servant should use all the remedies that lead to life. We say in, in the Gregorian liturgy, you have bound me with all the remedies that lead to life. So we use the mercy and we use the justice. We use this and we use that because both of them are remedies that lead to uh, life. So we focused on four weaknesses in the service of Jonah. The first one, how he want an easy service. He went to Tarshish, this very rich city. Number two, he was spiritually asleep. In the time in which he should respond and be alert, especially he knows very well that the storm is because of him, but he went asleep. And number three, he became arrogant because he is Hebrew. He felt he is better than the rest of the people. And he separated, isolated himself even from the sailors. And the last one, he separated justice from mercy and he preached only justice he did not reveal the mercies of god he told them after 40 days god will destroy the city he did not give them hope at all 
that God may forgive them. Not at all. But thank God they had hope in God and they repented and returned back to God. So these lessons should we learn from them, especially while we are fasting the fast of Jonah that's going to start tomorrow. Let's reflect on these lessons to benefit in our ministry and glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.